Hey everyone, this is Mason Hutchison, and welcome back to Herb Rally, your daily herbal podcast. We come out with new episodes about five days a week, so be sure to tune in often. Our goal for the show is to help you along your herbalist journey no matter what stage you're at. Uh, we have over 555 episodes, so please peruse those episodes and you're bound to find something of interest. Today's episode is with herbalist John Slattery, and he has a school in Arizona, an herb school, uh, where he teaches foraging and herbalism, vitalism, and whatnot. Uh, but in today's episode, you'll get a good feel for his teaching style. It's a class he taught with his students out in the field uh, about Cyanothus findlier. Findlieri. Findlierier. Jeez. Um, I don't know that species. We have uh, out in the Pacific Northwest, Cyanothus volutinus. Uh, I guess I'm in Wisconsin now, but yeah, when I was in herb school, we, we learned Cyanothus volutinus. But John generously provided this audio for us. You'll kind of hear the, the audio quality isn't the best. It was probably recorded on his phone uh, or some sort of recording apparatus out in the field, but um, they, they kind of do a, they, they have a discussion post-plant meditation. They talk about the medicinal properties of Cyanothus, uh, aka red root. Uh, but yeah, it'll give you a good feel for his teaching style. And if you're interested, John has two upcoming apprenticeships coming up. Well, one's called the Intro to Foraging course, and that's from February to November, February 2023 to November 2023. And all the classes are within one hour of Central Tucson or two hours from Central Phoenix. And in this foundational course, you'll learn nearly 100 wild plants for food and medicine. You'll become intimately familiar with key identifying features of our primary plants primary food plants. Uh, you'll learn to observe plants through the season to anticipate the bounty of the land and much more. I won't include everything here in the uh, pre-roll podcast pre-roll, but I'll leave a link in the show notes if you'd like to check out more about his 2023 foraging in the Sonoran Desert course. Uh, also coming up, he has his 2023 bioregional herbalist apprenticeship, and this is uh, even more in depth than the course I was just telling you about. You learn to identify nearly 200 wild plants for food and medicine. You become familiar with the basic concepts and principles of bioregional herbalism and an introduction to vitalism, and again, a lot more. But yeah, as I mentioned, if you like John's teaching style, uh, I'll leave a link to both of his of these apprenticeships in the show notes, uh, or you could just go to johnjslattery.com. You'll find more information there about what he's up to. So huge thanks to John for sharing the audio to today's episode. And also, before we get into the episode, I wanted to read a Apple Podcasts review. I haven't done this in a while. I want to start doing it again, uh, shouting all of you out who are kind enough to take the time to leave a written review in Apple Podcasts. So here we go. This one is from Wahidao. They said, great resource, great variety of guests and topics, full of helpful information about herbalism and our plant friends. Uh, so thanks, Wahi Dao. That's exactly what we're aiming for, uh, to be like a premier resource for herbal education with a diverse, uh, many diverse voices and backgrounds when it comes to herbalism. So uh, if you'd like a shout out on a future episode, please consider leaving a ranking and review in Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. I, re I read every single one of them and it always brings a smile to my face. Also, real quick, wanted to mention, if you'd like to get your first 30 days for free of the Herb Rally Schoolhouse, our membership area, you could use coupon code PODCAST at checkout. Learn more about that at herbrally.com slash schoolhouse. Uh, we come up with new and exclusive content each week for our members, along with other cool perks. So it's one of the best ways you can help support Herb Rally and our work. One more time, that's herbrally.com slash podcast, and use coupon code PODCAST at checkout to get your first 30 days for free. All right, that's going to do it for me today, and now on to John Slattery uh, with his class on Cyanothus. All right, talk to you tomorrow. Take care. A little bit of housekeeping before we get into the show. The content in this podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only. It is not intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent any disease. This information has not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. We are not doctors, nor do we play one on the internet. Please seek advice from a qualified healthcare professional. Okay, MC Calico, take it away. Yeah. Smoky herbal blends. We need some mullin and some kush, my brethren. While listening to Herb Rally podcast again. Herbalism at its finest with Mason Hutchinson.
Yeah. Does anyone have anything they'd like to share? Your brain was centered, is that what you said? My body, my mind, and that the sense of where I was kind of melted away, and I was just present. Very comfortable feeling like a globelia, like centered feeling, and in a state where you can just stay for hours. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Before I had the tincture, I kept having a vision of myself sitting in this like red fleshy cradle. And eventually I was like, I think I can mm. move. Before I took the tincture. And still, before I took the tincture, then I started having visions of other fleshy parts of the body. I saw muscle, I saw heart, and I saw lungs. Um, and then I took the tincture, and I noticed warmth starting here and going out to my extremities. Mm. I felt warmed by it. And I also noticed that just a sense of peacefulness and comfort. Like I could be in this for hours. Um, although for me, I would also say that this plant is kind of consciousness altering. And maybe you guys are saying the same thing, but in a different way. But um, kind of interesting perspective. For a couple months now, I've been practicing some methods for going into trance, for trance mediumship. And that takes me 10 or 15 minutes to, of just sitting quietly and finding stillness and breathing to start to lose myself. Trans mediumship means someone else comes in and does the talking that you trust. But you actually have to lose yourself in the process. You have to negotiate with your own consciousness and surrender and kind of move into the background so someone else can come through. And um, I had a really interesting experience with Red Root that reminded me of what it's like after about 15 minutes of sitting and breathing. Mm. It's just like, wow, I feel so relaxed and peaceful and my sense of self and all the noise, I can easily just kind of move it behind me and just be totally present with whatever other energy is with me. So just a slightly different perspective, I think, on the same thing that's being said. Um, it might have had a few pain killing effects for me too. I don't, I kind of felt uncomfortable when I sat down, but now my body feels more euphoric than anything, so. <laughs> Fairly shortly after taking the picture, um, I started behind with the closed eyes seeing a lot of spiraling, spiraling motion and spirals. Um, and then those sort of slowly wound down and it was replaced with, you know, I immediately noticed like a very, the mind just became silent, um, very similar to some experiences I've had in deep meditation that I often can't get to in deep meditation, like trying to meditate. Um, so just a very quiet mind and stillness, um, comfortable stillness. So I think it's similar to what I'm hearing. And, and, and I got so deep into that state that um, the spirals started coming and going again and I couldn't tell if my body, like I usually have a very good sense of balance. I couldn't really tell where, what my body was doing, if I was swaying or not. I was about to fall off my chair, so I, I had to open my eyes to like, find an anchor because <laughs> uh, I thought I might, I might tip over. <clears throat> um, and I had both with Mullen and with this, I was 
coughed a little bit somewhere in the middle there, which is weird because, so I have super screwed up lungs at the moment, but I haven't been coughing. I noticed with both of them, I coughed just a little bit. I'm not sure. It was just like the irritation suddenly came in there. how you're both describing that because it sounds like the hydraulic movement of lymph in the body or even the cerebral spinal fluid for that matter mm -hmm. just a very subtle pulsating mm -hmm. feel that I suppose if you got relaxed enough that it could sway the body mm -hmm. I was intentionally working with it at one point because it felt a lot like the chi and I could feel it expanding out into my hands and center of my palms and so I was in a similar way kind of rocking with it. Both tinctures we took were from the root. Um, this tincture is from the root of Gregii. Mm -hmm. what, what other tincture are you talking about? On the other side was Gregii. Two, Richard? No, the one that we processed that we made was integerimus. Correct, but we didn't. And we made the tincture from the leaf stems bark. What did we take orally? We took another integerimus tincture made somewhere else, also of the leaf stems and bark, I'm pretty sure. Not the root. Not the root, no. So this is the first time that we've taken the root together. Yeah. Hmm. And I could feel the remnants superficially of the actions of the mullen root in my body mm. but that the red root didn't it was way more general in terms of how it affected those areas in the lower jaw and throughout the process of this experience with the red root it kind of moved throughout the body starting initially in the chest with a strong reflexive inhalation that revitalized my whole torso and then gradually moved down and then eventually out. So that's that's common in my experience of red root that you have a global experience or universal experience that it moves throughout the whole body. Hey everyone, it's Mason. Just a quick interruption from the show to let you know about our 13 herbal freebies. If you go to herbrally.com on the navigation bar at the top of the page, you'll see a button that says freebies. Just click there and you'll sign up for our email newsletter. And in exchange, we're offering 13 herbal freebies. That's eBooks, webinars, videos, downloadable audio, and discounts to cool herbal companies. So if you'd like to check out these freebies as well as sign up for our email newsletter, we update you about uh, current events, new monographs, new videos, etc. Just go to herbrally.com and click on the button at the top of the page that simply says freebies. Okay, that's it from me. Now back to the show. Very 
I don't know if you know what you're saying or not, but in terms of known effects of red root on the blood. Mm. But before I say that, I find that my breathing is very often shallow in the sense that it's very calm. Yeah. It doesn't feel restricted or yeah. constricted, but it's relatively shallow when I'm in the middle of these rather deep plant meditations. Mm -hmm. I don't feel a need to breathe deep. It seems like extraneous work to try to breathe deeper. Yeah. That my breathing is sufficient where it's at. Yeah. So that's interesting. But what you just put together is is part of Red Root's known capacity to improve charge of the blood cells and enhance oxygenation in the blood. Mm. That relates to what I was saying earlier about that effect on how oh, the capillary action that brings fluid up to the tree canopy mm. is the same not similar if not the same action of how blood moves in our body through the repulsion of opposite charges on the blood cells pushing effectively through electromagnetic charge the blood through the body push and pulling simultaneously and what Michael Moore observed when he looked at the blood under the dark field microscope is that red root improved the, the charge of the blood thus allowing it to move more freely, i.e. thinning the blood. If you have thick, sticky blood, thrombosis, it's not, it's not very fluid. It's thick and sticky as opposed to thin and... Um, what's the word? Flowing. which is one of the main phenomenons that people have been experiencing not just since December 2020, January 2021, but even before that in thrombotic events. In the brain, in the lungs, in the vasculature. And so I've been advocating for the use of red root primarily for that reason. And it was in Stephen's initial protocol for COVID in order to protect the red blood cells, I think. Uh, he had it in the cell protection formula, but I don't even think he articulated that, but as a lymphatic mover. Mm. That, I think, yeah, it's relevant, but maybe arguably the least relevant quality of red root and that it improves blood charge and enables blood to move and not get stuck together but flow and thus potentially protecting quote protecting the red blood cells and not allowing them to stay not allowing them to lose their proper charge and then become more susceptible to whatever thick sticky blood is susceptible to and then it was borne out that they were discovering a lot of clots in people that were so-called COVID positive and they were operating on people removing blood clots in the brain and they closed people up and then they'd see there's like dozen more micro clots in the same area where they just removed the clot And so the, the discussion was around, around clotting, but no real, it's hard to say the discernible cause. They postulated that it was inflammatory scarring of the arterial structure as a consequence of the spike protein docking onto the ACE2 receptors.
and those ACE2 receptors supposedly all throughout the arterial structure. Although no receptor of any kind has ever been clearly seen. It's only been assumed or it's been uh, theorized inside out. <laughs> got a similar theory as to what Stephen was talking about, uh, Wabahim. What's the last thing you just said? Wabahim, the quality of that um, thing was, Mr. Cohen was talking about um, Oh, Wabin from the Strophanthus? Mm -hmm. So not Stephen, but you're talking about Tom Co oh, Cohen. Tom Cohen yeah. yeah, so kind of two different camps <laughs> in a way, but um, maybe so. But so Stephen removed, after all of this hubbub about clots, he revamped the formula on what he was reading, he read a lot of scientific papers, and then decided to take Red Root, Red Root out because by his assessment, it was clot forming, or it was pro-coagulant. That's the, that's the word, is coagulant. So I, I reached out, well, tell me, where'd you get this? Because it seems the exact opposite of what I understand red root to be. And so he sent me the, 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 art, not the articles, but the scientific papers from the early 20th into the 19th century. So I looked at him and I was like, Stephen, this is topical use of red root. It doesn't have anything. To, it's an astringent plant with lots of tannins. It's going to coagulate the blood on the surface. It's a, it's a, it's a styptic, not a, um, drawing a blank, what do you call it? Styptic is topical application. Hemostatic is internal Something that stops bleeding internally is hemostatic because it causes the blood to coagulate. And so by that premise alone, he removed red root from the protocol and replaced it with cleavers. Okay, cleavers has some value, but I figured it's not just a matter of what's the best, what's the least invasive or least harmful <laughs> lymphatic to use, but all the benefits that red root offers that are so unique to it yet so applicable to seemingly what people are experiencing so that just made no sense to me and, and i told him what i knew about red root and he just didn't respond so okay mm. i'm not going to follow suit i'm going to go my own way with this so i kept red root in the formula and have been advocating for that for that for it for, it, for that very reason so other people don't really speak about red root in this way i think it's something that got lost in the shuffle and what michael moore communicated to people but i think it's as significant about what red root offers as as anything alongside its affinity for the lymphatics but its ability to help move blood through the body in that very unique way is is very interesting because Here's something else tangentially that hopefully is, is relevant enough for me to bring it up. But I was listening to a podcast on oxalates. So some woman who's studied oxalates extensively was um, decrying the, you know, the, the damage is done by oxalates. And by saying oxalates, you have a grouping of different uh, oxalic forms that are crystal or in their acid form. And what she said was very interesting in relation to some phenomenon that I hadn't heard of, but oxalate-induced anemia. Well, it's the electrical charge, she, she states, of the oxalic acid that affects the blood cell and somehow induces anemia. I don't know exactly, I haven't thought it all the way through how that relates um, to the blood in terms of how you get to anemia and what we're saying about red root but it's yet another indication of how imperative it is if that's true to have the proper charge on the blood for the blood as an organ system to perform its function properly and what could potentially interfere with the blood's electro electromagnetic charge other than environmental electromagnetic frequency
In fact, there is a lesser known form of diabetes that had been classified over a decade ago known as type 3 diabetes that was identified upon exposure to electromagnetic frequency that in, induced um, cardiac irregularities as well as metabolic syndrome or hyperglycemia as a consequence of people. Uh, for example, they tested people with their cell phone activated next to their, next to their bed. And this is over a decade ago type cell phones, not the modern smartphone. And that with, with a heart monitor on them for the night and their irregular heartbeats or rapid heartbeats or whatever parameters that they were measuring and, and conditions that they were identifying were becoming exacerbated at, at night while they slept with the cell phone. And then, of course, did the opposite or removed the cell phone and those conditions didn't return. And again, if we're all seated, seated around mullen root, and even if, even if you want to just focus on the ingestion of the tincture, through a biochemical model, there's not enough compounds and constituents in the tincture in a couple of drops to be processed through our digestive system to have all of these uh, relevant phys physiological experiences. But in a model of resonance, where we have a heart field resonance that has been identified, has been measured with unique instruments, so that it extends beyond us, what do they say, 20, 25 feet or something like that, that we can, it can be picked up by instruments. And then as an instrument itself, I would argue it can pick up what's around us in the proximity. Six feet apart. <laughs> so if if you have if you have an organ that operates according to resonance of the electromagnetic field and you have unique disturbances in the history of humankind in the electromagnetic field could that not alter the function of the organ or at least interfere with it for some people And is that enough that you took, Sarah, for example, to oxygenate your cells sufficiently that you have the experience of 15 minutes of breathing exercises? Nope. I already thought about that. Like, <laughs> how? There's no way. <laughs> right. And in the same way, how does the heart pump the blood? What's interesting also in that regard for those that have doubts about that challenge of that presumption that the heart pumps, pumps the blood. The two points where the blood is at its greatest force of pressure is on the entrance and the exit to the heart. So how does that work? We would all have varicosities coming out of our toes if that was <laughs> we were reliant upon the heart if it starts out, if it ends on the greatest pressure and then starts on the greatest pressure, how does it end on the greatest pressure and come all the way through and then end on the greatest pressure? Vortex. Yeah, that's it. It's a vortex. And the exit, it's called the aortic arch, where the blood first comes out of the heart, is like, is a curve. And as Dr. Cowan points out, if you could have your hose off and you know put it into a curve and then as soon as you turn the pressure on what happens to the hose does it stay into the curve position or is it straighten out right through the force of the pressure in the hose does the aortic arch remain curved yes it does but through the vo action of vortex the sucking in it's like the air gets sucked into the heart on the on the don't know all the vernacular but on the entrance um, and then causes a propulsion on the opposite end and probably the aortic arch has a lot to do with the induction of the vortex as well
So is it possible that things we've been taught to believe are absolute truths are actually just conjured up theories? Sure, have all the have all the theories you want, but should we base our life entirely on theories? Is that a healthy thing or do we need to test them out to see if I mean, you can have a number of working theories going. But something as as basic as that, like yeah, of course the heart pumps the blood. Yet there's ample evidence evidence to put it mildly that that's impossible. So if that's the case, then how does it happen? Well, the Chinese had some concept of that and that they recognized the liver contributed to the movement of the blood. From, in their cosmology, that's, that's how the blood moves, is through the energy of the liver. Mm-hmm. It's not to say that, you know, it sounds preposterous, like, yeah, how's the liver pumping the blood? Well, of course, the heart's contracting. The heart's, you know, so some very basic, uh, you know, logical argument, you know, you could win out on a superficial level claiming that the heart is the muscle that's pumping the blood. And I can't claim to be able to explain it, but I witness it in the phenomenon of, say, how herbs that relax, constrain chi in the liver, now suddenly people experience blood flow out to the surface where it was otherwise constrained into the center. So it seems to me indirectly, red root serves as a, what we would call cardiovascular remedy. I think it's more vascular and cardio is kind of, maybe we've incorrectly paired the heart with the vasculature and maybe the heart is just as intimately paired with the liver. In Chinese medicine, it's considered the mother and the heart and the liver is the son. So it's a mother-son relationship. That when strained causes a variety of imbalances and either on either side in either direction. You can have the rebellious liver causing heartburn, or you can have emotional heart, you know, the pains withheld in the emotional heart that precipitate liver disease. But red fruit, I still feel is one of those herbs that given the chance I'd put in the water supply. At least homeopathically. Mm. Anything else to add? I think I definitely experienced the the vascular effects. I as a progression throughout the day between mullen and even just sitting with um, golden smoke and lunch like there was a very downward drawing energy in my body like between my root and then eating lunch and my digestive tract and it was just like very feeling very um lethargic and actually like my i was getting a headache like i there was constriction or like dryness or um lack of blood flow to my head and neck and brain um, towards the end of this sitting was very um, profoundly like, changing my heart rate and then releasing my my headache and I just felt like I needed to put my hand right here and I just need to like move side to side <laughs> like, mm-hmm. that movement and this plant was really um, I don't have a headache and I feel much better <laughs> mm-hmm. You, you say you feel much better? Mm-hmm. And that was after taking the the tincture. But I will say before taking the tincture, it was like 
just sitting and focusing on the plant with my eyes closed. It was quite, um, I would say, consciousness altering. There was this, I forgot about it until after I sat with this, but I saw a giant elk print when I was sitting with the mullen, like in my mind's eye, it was like probably the biggest elk track I've ever seen. And it was singular, it wasn't like on a path, it was just like one. Mm. And, um, and immediately as I sat down with this, there was this giant bull elk, like seven by seven, huge, and it was like right here, like right where <laughs> this plant is at, right where Sarah is at. And, and it was um, intensely bugling and just the most like masculine energy and it was really to the point where I could like see its breath in the cold, it's not that cold, but it seemed like it was colder. I could see its breath in the cold air. And then it was like looking at me and it was like, fearful of me, but I was like, you know, there's a giant elk like right here. It's like, <laughs> like it was um, really intense. I noticed so intensely like my heart rate elevating and this level of like reverence, but fear too of like this elk is huge and I'm way too close. And um, yeah, that like kind of dissipated as quickly as it came on. And then, um, and then the tincture was coming around and I got involved in that, but but that feeling of like this big heart feeling of a mix of things that I can't even, like the words are not doing it justice, but um, that remained and just kind of seemed to evolve into more of a comforting feeling with the, the tincture, but, um, but that same level of like intenseness in my heart space and like that pumping feeling in my whole body of almost almost adrenaline but not it started as adrenaline and now it feels more just like energy but that was that was intense <laughs> not at all like like Mullen and there's very few plants that have I've seen like such an intense like I'm not right here I'm in some other mm. space um, hmm. there's something else happening around me. It's really... Mullen was like, he's crazy, <laughs> like, kind of nice, and this is <laughs> Is that what Sergio's hunting this weekend? Elk? No, um, white-tailed deer. I did think about that though because it like that elk right towards the end as I was like losing sight of it it softened and I softened and I was like oh, did that somebody just hunted me Excellent. Any other comments or questions? I think I'll add that um, the other part of my experience, which can also come with meditating and breathing, is feeling a fullness both in my own presence and my space. I'm just feeling like a really full pressure. I don't know how else to describe it. But it's like a comforting, energetic 
powerful feeling. Mm -hmm. found some of the words I was looking for, like the fullness, mm, mm -hmm. the pressure, mm. but not in a, 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 not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. you know? mm. I wouldn't even say comforting, because it's not always comforting, but like, just is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And that's going to do it for today's episode. Thanks so much for listening to the Herb Rally podcast. If you'd like to hear more from us here at Herb Rally, we now have a text message community, believe it or not. Basically, it's just updates from us. We send about one to seven texts per week, uh, notifying you about new events, videos, courses, podcasts. You get the idea. It's pretty much like our email newsletter, just in text form. So if you'd like to receive text messages from Herb Rally, just text JOIN, that's J-O-I-N, to the number 541-256-2895. Again, that's JOIN to number 541-256-2895. And to stop receiving texts, that's easy too. Just text STOP to the same number. It'll opt you out immediately. Okay, thanks again for listening. Have a great rest of your day.